Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. It's Gavin White here, CEO of Autotech Group. Um, great privilege today to have a, a panel on, on today to discuss all of everything EV in the next half an hour. Um, as we know, the government um, uh, changed the uh, legislation uh, a couple of weeks back now, and, uh, and uh, EV is certainly on the subject of everybody I'm talking to at the moment um, around the rush around training and cars and technology and everything else. But we, for, for the industry, we all know how that uh, how that's been affecting people over the last decade or so as, as cars have been slowly moving into the industry, but that's that's naturally going to speed up. But it's everything else in between that we want to discuss today. So with me today, just to do some quick intros, uh, welcome to Steve Nash from the IMI. Morning, Steve. How are you doing? He very kindly has uh, um, said to, he would very kindly co-chair this meeting with me today. So we've got some uh, tasty questions for our panel today. I uh, have Ben Davis from uh, Marsh Commercial. Morning, Ben. Uh, Morning. Ben Smith from PQB. Morning, Ben. Uh, Prashant Chopra from Auto Gemin Victor. Morning. Morning. Andy Cotton from BG Products. Morning, Andy. Morning, all. And uh, Kevin Kelly from Bosch. Morning, Kevin. Morning, all. How are you doing? And uh, apologies from a few of our other partners, and uh, I'll discuss the partner a bit quickly in a minute, but uh, Jack Allman, unfortunately, from ASF Finance, couldn't make today. Daniel King from Ting Tools. Chris Warner from Haynes Pro. Uh, ben Stockton from our Virtual Academy. And Lorraine Lonergan from BP Pulse, um, for, uh, which was BP Charge Master. But for those of you who uh, know, they've just gone through a rebrand and now called BP Pulse. Um, unfortunately, those guys couldn't make it, but just wanted to give those uh, guys a shout out on this. Um, for those of you who know uh, Autotech Recruit, we're, we're now um, moving very quickly into training, Autotech training, and uh, all the guys on the uh, panel here and all the other people that couldn't make it today very kindly offered to partner with us moving forward. And, and for us, it's not about uh, just people coming along getting electric vehicle training it's about whole experience and, and everything else that affects them from a from an electric vehicle perspective so that could be anything from technology to data to to uh to insurance products and and everything else in between so with no further ado let's go underway so i sent all of our uh, sent all of our panelists today a, a question which was um which was quite a generic question but i think it's quite fitting because we've got so many different people from different areas of the industry involved in this uh, on this discussion point today. So, the question I asked to everybody was, "How is the uh, the transformation to to the EV industry affecting you and your business, and what do you see for the future?" So, uh, Ben, without further ado, uh, you're, you're the first one up. So, how do you see the the industry, the uh, insurance market and industry, um, uh, moving forward uh, with around electric vehicles? Thanks, thanks, Gavin. Um, it, it it's a changing industry. Um, obviously, the, the current insurance market is going through um, a bit of a rocky landscape, a bit of a hardening market as we speak, anyway. But with with ever with any any new products that are coming out in the market, it, it's it's an inherently new thing that we're trying to experience. So, when you combine electric vehicles with the the liability element of obviously for somebody working on them really does open up a whole new channel of questions, uh, risk management. At Marsh, we try to stay around risk management as our, our key focus and understanding the training, the awareness of the people actually working on the vehicles is, is key. So I think from a business point of view, it will help. And I think it will help all the business owners with the more we can work with business owners in an EV installers or EV manufacturers um, I actually think that we will we'll, we'll be able to help a lot of business owners in the future and, and from our point of view obviously the more business owners we can engage with it, the more insurance premiums we can help and assist and make sure they uh, that they're, they're correctly covered which is is key nowadays is it's easy to get insurance cover but getting the right cover to cover all your staff and any exposures is, is the biggest the biggest thing that we find so mm. I know we were just talking a few bits about this off air. Steve, Steve, you brought up some interesting points on this that you think is, is very, uh, you, you're obviously very interested in, certainly around the IMI tech safe side of things. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, 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 to say that this is kind of uh, um, 
slightly wild west stuff. You know, I mean, we're, we, we've kind of, we've, we've, We've jumped a hundred years, haven't we? we? We've got a model uh, in, the, in the automotive industry that's, a, that's pretty much a hundred years old. Go take it back to the First World War. That's when the modern motor industry evolved as we know it. Um, and and um, this is a complete change. This is a complete change. And look, government um, on, on a macro level, it's one thing to, to, to mandate that you can't sell internal combustion engine cars from 2030. When you get down to the detail, the government aren't really that much more knowledgeable than anybody else, you know. So I know because we took a whole series of MPs along to a manufacturer's academy and showed them electric cars and everything we showed them blew their mind. Because to them, a car's a car's a car, you know, when you lift the bonnet and show them how different it is. And then when you say to them, well, what, what regulations exist around this? And as you know, I mean, I think it was a at least a three year crusade on my part personally with the revolving door of, of, of ministers to try and get them to understand that you need to make sure that the people who start working with this stuff know what they're doing. And it turned out not with any help from the government, but we were able to establish that actually the existing electricity at work act applies. So there is regulation around people working on, on electric cars. Believe it or not, anything over 50 volts, which pretty much even includes a mild hybrid, because they operate above 48 volts, don't they? So, you know, um, and that's what we built the IMI tech safe standards off the back of. So, but, but the question really around the insurance and, and, and um, it's probably a fair, fair point to put to you, to you, Ben, is, you know, if somebody does ask somebody to do work on one of these vehicles and, uh, and, and take the risk without the proper training and maybe without yeah. the proper equipment too, and they get injured or worse because, you know, 800 volts of direct current up your arm is going to do more than spoil your day, isn't it? Um, if that were to happen, where would they stand with their liability insurance? So going back to, uh, again, what I said, Steve, is, is the, key, the key point is making sure that the insurers are aware of any activities that are being undertaken by garages or facet centres. Um, hybrids, when, when we go in, when we're doing our fact finds with our clients, for example, hybrids are a question set for us now the the standard combustion you know are you doing rf134a gas you know are you doing aircon that's out of the window hybrid vehicle questioning is where a lot of motor manufacturers a lot of motor insurers are asking us now um when i've engaged with underwriters about this is the liability element will be could be contested because it would be has the garage owner given the right the right training but then has the technician worked to the standard you know if they've got level one in ev training is that relevant to their to the vehicle that they're actually working on you know if they need a level three qualification is that relevant to to what standard they're working to so um it, it would be it would be something that would be possibly a contentious issue with with the liability but i think as long as insurers have the more information you can give to an insurer, the better response you'll get from an insurer. Now, there could be a, a knock-on effect with regards to premiums there, but I think everyone would agree you'd rather have a slightly higher premium if the cover in, in such an incident, you know, an 800-volt battery is going to, as you said, Steve, it's going to cause, uh, like I said, a bit, bit more than a few straight hairs. So... Um, <laughs> I think um, I think I think the, the, the from a liability point of view, the, the the garage has to take responsibility as much as the the employee as well. Well, there's no doubt that in that case they'd be open to prosecution by the safety executive. So, yeah. so then I think that might influence the insurer's decision about whether mm. or not they would pay out. I, I guess. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and Ben, just quickly before we move on to uh, to someone else, uh, another subject. The, do you think would you envisage this um, potentially causing a problem for uh, for personal insurance policies moving forward? Because you know, is this really now the demise of the home mechanic? You know, because I know there's general things are you filling up your washer bottles and stuff like that, but you know, cars are becoming you know have been more complex the last ten or twenty years. But mm. I remember when I was growing up, my dad was always out on the drive doing something with the car, but that generally doesn't happen. I know, but. 
you know, would insurance companies potentially even start to write this into people's personal insurance policies moving forward? I don't know. Um, when you look at <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, when you look at personal kind of personal lines insurance, you've got personal household insurance, so to speak, and you know, having an EV charger on the side of your house completely changes your bricks and mortar cover. Um, I think it will. I, I think it will. I, I couldn't give you a definitive answer because these insurers are. It, it's a fluid market. They are changing and doing training. I, I know, for example, there's a training course next week from an insurer on electric vehicle, um, whether it's charging or it's electric vehicle maintenance. So um, the, the the market is changing almost on a daily constant at the moment. So uh, hey, what, what, you just dropped a little bomb in there, actually. Uh, <laughs> that I don't know that I, I have to pick up on. I, I personally didn't know that having an EV charger on your house changed your bricks and mortar insurance and and uh i don't know how many of the, the rest of the panel did but that's a really really important point mm. you know um because i've got one <laughs> 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 and uh you know uh but i think for a lot of people i mean th these are pieces of information that, that are not in in the uh, out there uh, uh, they're not common knowledge are they no they're not no they're not at all and when you insure your house, in most, in most cases, you know, if you if you roll over your insurance, rather, you'd obviously make a new declaration if you were changing insurance. If you yep. roll over your insurance, insurance, you wouldn't know that you needed to declare that. So that's no. a very important point. Exactly that. And when you go for your household insurance, you don't get asked what type of vehicle you have. Mm. So the no. the kind of, the connecting points are almost a bit a, a bit. A bit, a bit there really because you know Steve if you've got an EV or a hybrid when you book your household insurance you don't need to ask the question what vehicle have you got because it's not relevant to your household so swings and roundabouts but yeah completely okay that's an interesting one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh well thanks for that Ben I'm sure no we'll come back, we may come back to that uh, later on so I think yeah it is an interesting subject and you know, there's plenty to talk about in that but Moving on to so more of a from a I suppose a technology point of view, uh, Ben Smith, um, director and founder of Procubi. I mean, Ben, how do you see this? You know, from the, from the sort of work and sort of technology perspective from you guys, how do you see this affecting the industry moving forward? Well, I mean, we we provide video health tech solutions to to workshops. So our our technology is around the consumer experience. It's about convenience. Um, and from a workshop's point of view, it's about them being transparent and, and building that trust with the customer. And I think I look at it from a sort of a marketing point of view, from a consumer point of view, how we are influenced in life by what we do and see and read online. And there's a lot of fake news around. You can't really trust everything that you see online. I think fake news is probably responsible for the Brexit decision, for Trump being in power, for all sorts of false information around COVID and things like that. So I think for all businesses moving forward, building trust with your customer is going to be very important. And video is a very good way of doing that. It's, it's about being transparent and building that legitimacy. But I think also if you think about vehicles already are, are evolving massively, they're becoming very digitally orientated. You know, you've got connected cars, you've got smartphone apps, you've got key fobs that will talk to you, you've got digital cockpits. I think I saw over Christmas Tesla pushed out a, an update to their vehicles that gave you like a Christmas theme in your, on your dashboard within your car. So the whole vehicle ownership is already becoming a very digital experience and I can't even imagine or comprehend what an EV in 10 years time is going to look like but it's it's going to be an incredibly digital experience and I think as consumers if your vehicle ownership and, and using it and driving it is, a, is that sort of digital experience, then you would expect all aspects of your vehicle to be digital as well. So I think workshops will need to sort of adapt more. They need to embrace digitalization, video technology, and that kind of thing to make them relevant to, to the consumer because it's, it's such an important thing that the whole customer-centric journey is there. So... From my personal point of view, I think what we do um, with the with 
within the sector and won't massively be affected by EVs. I think what we do will become more of a norm, much more of an expectation. I think that if you think in 10 years' time, the people who are going to be buying an EV are going to be the millennials who will be, you know, 30-something to 50-year-olds, probably about an average age, and they're going to have grown up with this type of technology. So I think it's just meeting the, the changing um, consumer expectations and demands moving forward. Yeah, I think, it, I suppose one of the other subjects, and I suppose definitely with um, technology, we were speaking to a couple of vehicle manufacturers this week, and uh, and actually, you know, the, the progression and the speed, um, you know, they started talking about cloud-based, you know, all sorts of data. I mean, I think data is going to be a big thing around this as well, aren't they? Because in terms of how you connect your car at home, uh, I know we've just bought a, a, a we've got a VW ID3, and you know all of that can be monitored. You charge, and everything can be done through an app-based system, and that, so, and we all know through you know things like block exemption and all the other stuff that's going on at the moment that data is going to be a massive, massive battleground over this as well, isn't it? Because EV vehicles are giving vehicle manufacturers that opportunity to, to sort of you know, go out there with the technology, but to potentially bring in other powerful elements to that as well and using that, that technology to really enhance their, their, their opportunity potentially, you know. Mm. It's also yeah. part of, a, part of a, a, a sea change, isn't it, uh, isn't it Kevin? Uh, 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 Gavin, sorry. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, we're looking at a situation where we've already talked about EVs and, and the need for people to know what they're doing. I mean, regulatory need for people to know what they're doing when they're working on these things. You throw in uh, autonomous technologies. Already, you've got ADAS already, you know, uh, but, but when you get to cars that have got substantial abilities to drive themselves, it's, it's beggar's belief that you'd be able to work on those things without having certifiable skills. You know, uh, and you would no more get in an autonomous car that had been serviced by somebody who didn't have certifiable skills than you would get in an aircraft in, in the same circumstances. Similarly, when we get to the data piece, Ben, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about moving to a situation where you've got seamless transition from your car to your office to your home and what have you. And all of that data being, you know, there and present in the car, you're going to want to know who's working on it, aren't you? You know, and, and, and you're going to want to, again, you want to, you're going to know what their credentials are, aren't they? I, I would imagine, aren't you? Uh, absolutely. I think that's one of the advantages of video as well is that, it's, it's allowing the technicians to get across their professionalism, their expertise. These are the people who are qualified and trained to work on your vehicle. And by giving them a voice, letting them present themselves to you, the customer, the vehicle owner, build, you, build that confidence that I know what I'm doing. I'm a trained technician working on your vehicle. This is my professional opinion of what you should do. It gives the consumer a lot more confidence that my car is in safe hands. I mean, I, I'm very much here for the benefit of independence. I work pretty much exclusively with independence and, and some national fast fits. Franchise dealers are very, very good at embracing this kind of technology and, and using it to, to kind of lure customers away from independence or to keep them within the, the network from, from buying that new vehicle to keeping it in the network in year four, five, and six after the typical three-year window. Um, so I think independents really need to sort of embrace this kind of technology to compete with the franchise dealers because there are lots of fantastic, very well-trained and equipped independents out there who are absolutely perfect um, for, for working on electric vehicles. They've got the skills and, and the expertise to do that. It's just giving the consumer the confidence that, that you can do that. Um, so again, I think using technology to, to sell your business, to sell your skills and expertise to, to the vehicle owners is, uh, is going to be important moving forwards. Cheers, Ben. Thanks for that. Um, Prashant, now I know, uh, you know, that, that this could pose a real headache and challenge for your business moving forward. And, and I'm sure probably Andy's in the same boat as well. But we'll come on to Andy in a minute, but you know, from the, on the different side of the fence, really, you know, uh, from a business and I know you've got factories and manufacturing that are very much built around, you know, exhaust pipes and exhaust brackets and things like this. And, 
you know, EV vehicles don't have exhaust. So, you know, how's this really good? How's this going to hit you guys? I think it's, it's quite interesting. We're absolutely aligned to the internal combustion engine, as, as you're saying. it. And uh, Autogen was founded in the 60s selling exhaust fittings uh, when, when exhaust used to fall off. Um, and, and nowadays, exhausts don't fall off like they used to, unfortunately. But, but if we look back, there's been a lot of evolution. So in the 90s, uh, the materials that were used on original equipment exhausts improved dramatically. And that meant replacement volumes started dropping um combine in the fact that aftermarket exhaust manufacturers started giving aluminized steel rather than mild steel exhaust systems that gave longer warranties and that reduced you know exhaust fitting volume as well but then you throw in we got catalytic converters and they used to fail arguably because of different reasons it could be sensors it might not be the cat itself and uh, cap replacement increased. And with that proliferation of parts came along. Similarly, we had diesel particulate filters come along. And yes, this ban on ice is definitely going to hit us. But um, I think we've still got some time uh, with, with our beloved combustion engine. And I think we, we are definitely going to start seeing the effects over time. I'd say another 10 years or so, it's going to start hitting harder and harder and harder in 20 years. I don't think there's going to be an emissions business to pass on to Chopra Jr., let's put it that way. Um, but we're already adapting to that. And we identified this a long time ago, actually, when we bought the Autogen business and we realized exhaust volumes are dropping. How can we get involved in different sectors? So as a business, we got heavily involved in the tire industry and we do tire consumables and TPMS and our wiper blades and, and things like that, which aren't necessarily affected by the internal combustion engine. And I really enjoyed listening to what Ben just had to say. Ben number two, I'm going to say, not Ben number one. I enjoyed what you had to say, and I'm terrified about the EV charging point thing that you brought up as well. But, but Ben number two, I really liked about what he talked about engagement with the consumer, and perhaps we can touch on that a little bit later on. And we are now looking at products that can help our customers engage with their customers effectively um, and, and improve things. But I think fundamentally whatever we have, we're going to have to treat this ban just like we've treated 2020 as a COVID year. Uh, and it's challenge and we have to embrace it. We have to deal with it. We have to be nimble. We have to think on our feet to thrive for the future. That's the only option we have. Uh, the, the most bizarre conversation I had the other day was when we went to pick up an electric vehicle for, for my mum for her birthday and I asked, what's the service schedule on this vehicle? And they said, we don't actually know. I thought that was quite incredible. And, and a conversation that I had with a, a vehicle manufacturer we deal with, um, they were saying that uh, people are complaining about the service costs on one of their small electric vehicles that they had. And I said, well, what's the service cost? It's 110 pounds. Really? And they're complaining about a 110 pound service. Um, yeah, they actually are. And so we're all having to deal with this and adapt with this, whether we're even the vehicle manufacturers dealing with that replacement parts business, which they may not have going forwards and whatever the serviceability of these vehicles are going forward. We're going to have to think that's the only choice we have. Do you think pressure, I mean, to, to some extent, and it's interesting what you said, because it, it resonates with me. I mean, I, some of you may know I was an after sales director for an OEM for 15 years. And I kind of, um, I, the after sales business is always like dancing, dancing on a burning stage, isn't it, to a degree? Because your big opportunities are always disappearing, but you're always kind of out there finding new ones. You know, you, you look back to, I mean, you've mentioned a few things, but you look back to when we used to fit, radios in every car we used to fit cd changes we used to fit alarms we and these were big ticket items but you yeah. but they've all come and gone haven't they and you know actually there aren't those kind of things anymore you have to find more opportunities and they're generally smaller ones and last for shorter periods of time but but amazingly enough as a total entity the after sales business has continued to grow hasn't it and and it's um 
But it's, I think this is definitely a sea change, isn't it? And it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge us more than the loss of CD changes, probably. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I, I, it's amazing how adaptive the industry is, though, and how inventive the industry is in terms of, uh, of discovering new business streams, isn't it? I, I think if we don't adapt, we're going to see a lot of, unfortunately, big names that we've heard of for many, many years just going by the wayside. But we've had time to think about this, to be honest. You know, the government's been muting this for a good few years now. It must be three, four years, I would imagine. Um, and we've certainly been having internal discussions here about it and external discussions where we're saying to our, you know, large national um, and regional fast fit and auto center type businesses that we deal with. Are you in, are you investing in EV? Are you investing? What are you guys doing? Are you, are you looking at the income streams? Can you cope with those vehicles coming into your workshops? So um, we, we want to know our customers are also uh, investing for the future as well. And, and to be fair, I think everyone's getting the wake up call, whether they like it or not. And, 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 and things like this will engage people better as well. Won't it? I think interesting, you just go back to the point you said about the 110 pound for a service, you know, and I think that's an interesting point to perhaps discuss a bit later on is about, customers um, the general public's perception of value around and i think this goes back to ben's myth's point ben to uh, his point about you know where that camera technology adds that that value and people you know because i think you know there is a general feeling out there and i think you know you could even look at you know the amount of people that perhaps have uh, play, played which is probably the wrong word but um, should we say use the MOT extension to to its fullest? You know uh, the general customer. You know the, the perception of the consumer nowadays. And I remember you know my days working back in Suzuki. You know used to get very, a lot of people used to come and go. You know fifty thousand miles on a year and a half old Suzuki Swift, and it's like, what do you mean I've got to put oil in it? You know, <laughs> that's why it sounds like a pack of nails. I'm afraid. You know, and people think you just change the end and under, under warranty. No, <laughs> it don't work like that. You know? <laughs> It is, it is interesting because that little anecdote that you gave kind of underlines the fact there will be people who think it's an electric car. Yeah. What do you mean it's a service? You know, uh, even though they'll still expect it to accelerate like a robber's dog, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and, and do 100 miles an hour and everything else and stop on a sixpence, but they'll just think it's an electric car. What, what, what service can it possibly need, you know? Uh, I, I think what's I think what's really interesting we've got we got Kevin coming on in in a bit and I'm I'm really intrigued to, to hear what you have to say but not just EV we've got autonomous coming along as well and that kind of technology is really going to be quite complicated and I, I think mm -hmm. from a consumer they've got to understand people have to be trained to deal with these quite complex vehicles there is a cost to their labour there's That's a cost right. to their time purely just to check and look at these things and, and diagnose them. Um, and, and, and that has to be just a, a basic acceptance. I mean, that's just reality, isn't it? We're, we're not robots. Um, Absolutely, yeah. People are very happy to pay for an expensive haircut. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth of it. Yeah. Uh, the cars will run for nothing, but they'll pay 150 quid to have a haircut. It's just mad. No, that's true. not happening. That's not happening in my house, as you can see, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter did this one, and she's I eleven. <laughs> I didn't pay for it. Clearly, I was thinking, I was thinking more females, though, Prashant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's no, interesting because we were talking earlier on, weren't we, Gavin, about the fact that um, you know that you you get these sort of new income streams evolving through the connected apps and things like that. So I was saying to you, wasn't I, about. Uh, Somebody I, I know, somebody in the industry who decided to run a, uh, well, I think I can say, I think he, he ran a, a Tesla Model S for a while and was relatively surprised a few months in when his rear heated seat stopped working. And that apparently was an introductory offer. And if he wanted to keep them working, he had to kind of, you know, continue the subscription on them. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting, that's an interesting kind of departure in terms of income streams but you know i said to you myself i mean i've got a car that's just hit its three-year point it's on a four-year lease and and i've had to renew all of the connected services on that because they all come in a three-year package you know and and uh, so uh, interesting times actually yeah yeah online services and that's it you know that 
the car's now going to be, you know, connected to, you, it's almost like you Amazon Prime, Netflix, it's, it's all just monthly, monthly charge. Subscription. Subscription. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Andy, um, obviously we were chatting last night about, um, you know, probably similar to, to Prashant as well, you know, um, you know, I know you've, you've got some passionate um, feelings about this, so uh, far away. Thanks, guys. Um, a couple of things just before I, I, I say what I, what I prepared or wanted to, to just add to this discussion. But um, Ben, too, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the, the video um, uh, health check and, and um, <coughs> the, oh, excuse me, the confidence that gives consumers is, is incredible. Um, and I'm amazed at how slowly it's being uh, adapted and accepted in this country because um, our experience from BG USA, so we're BG UK, but BG USA, the, uh, they've got um, some training suites and some uh, video suites, uh, technologies that they've incorporated for their customers. And the, the, the numbers on it have been absolutely incredible. I mean, just ridiculous amounts of money it's created. Um, and I'm, I'm shocked at how slowly it's been adapted and, and, uh, and accepted in this country. So fingers crossed you'll continue to do so because I totally agree. Giving that, uh, that professional opinion, um, you know, if you had an, an online dentist looking in your mouth, you'd accept everything he said because you'd assume that you've been trained properly. Mm. Amazing in, in our industry how people look, hey, you're a mechanic, it's only a car, what do you know? I won't bother changing the oil. Mm. Uh, you know, it's terrifying. Um, so what I wanted to add, if it's okay, um, and I'm, I'm very much obviously in the same group as Prashant here, which is that our business is, is 99% around uh, ICE engines. Um, although BG are trying very hard to come up with some, uh, and we do have some EV product, uh, some HEV product, um, but coming up with opportunities uh, for our customers regarding HEV and, and EV with other fluids and, and other moving parts. But I think... Um, what I wanted to add was just a, just a, hopefully just a tiny bit of balance. Not that I think it's been, it's been very much uh, electric, uh, uh, praising the electric God uh, in this session so far anyway, but that we have around about 39 million internal combustion engines on the UK roads at the moment. Uh, the capital expenditure of getting rid of those and putting in electric is just, just impossible. Um, and that's on one side. There's another couple of arguments that we could put in along the side of carbon output, carbon production costs on EV being, being considerably greater than, than ICE. And then another final one on this, just on keeping it very simple, is that actually, I, I did the math and we, uh, we checked it with the national grid. Um, it would only take something like half a million electric cars plugged in at once to cripple the national grid. So, you know, much as the, the government's idea and, and proposal, we absolutely agree with it. Don't get me wrong, we have to get away from carbon reliance. If nothing else, it's only going to last about another 30 or 40 years anyway. Um, I'm just saying that potentially and hopefully, with all the problems that will come out of EV, um, which will be rechargeable batteries and then them not being able to be recycled and then a loss, loss of power and the ability to, to create the power to charge the batteries, and then you just think about the size of the vehicles that they're going to try and generate. So, you know, yes, we have now got some, some buses on the roads, um, but I know that they're struggling. So, for example, um, Edinburgh Council bought, I think it was 12 electric buses that I had to put out of service immediately because they wouldn't go up the hills with passengers on them. Um, you know, it just, there are things that are shortcoming. So think about all our delivery trucks and all our HGV and, and LCVs that are out there, you know, running around all day long running out of charge you know imagine how, how annoyed that mr Con- mr and mrs consumer are going to be when the amazon ring them up to tell them sorry the, the battery's flat you have to wait till tomorrow um you know the, the guy did his 60 miles that was all we could get out of the charge and we've got to tow it back to the garage and it's now going to be put back on charge and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think a little bit at this moment my uh, my point back to uh, to gavin was well, it's a little bit like we're all in this stasis at the moment where we believe there's a future and yes, it has to be an alternative future. It has to be non-carbon reliant. So whether that's HEV or whether that's EV or hydrogen or nitrogen or all sorts of other things that have been talked about and I'm sure people are working on, um, that yes, we need to know that we have these things coming. So it's a bit like at the moment, we're all in lockdown, believing that the vaccine is going to set us free. 
But nobody would ever say that, you know, whilst we're waiting for the vaccine, ah, don't worry about it. Don't bother washing your hands. Don't bother wearing a mask. Don't bother with social distancing because there's a vaccine coming. There's a vaccine coming. Mm. So my point purely about adding to this is that, yes, EV is important. HEV is important. Yes, training is critical. And absolutely can't agree. Any, I couldn't agree more with the fact that, yes, anybody working on these, on these new engines, new technology needs to be trained perfectly and properly and consistently up-trained because one, as you say, one 800 volt up your arm is not going to do you much for your day. Um, so making sure that the industry adapts and the industry trains and the industry looks after its professionals and they are regarded as professionals to be able to charge proper money for a proper trained job, a proper skill, and that will then grow and develop. So as I said, just coming back to this vaccine thing, I think we ought not to ignore the fact that we have and let's call it for sake of argument, 30 million internal combustion engines for the next 20, 30 years, possibly. That, you know, we should be focusing on the future. We should be applying our brains to what's coming. We should be looking for new opportunities, but we shouldn't ignore the existing opportunities and we're still not maximizing those. So Ben Two's about the video. Absolutely, that's exactly right. Show the customer why it needs for sake of argument, why you'd recommend it has a brake fluid change or it has an internal... It has a, a power steering fluid change or whatever it happens to be. Um, and these are things that obviously is BG Products USA. We, uh, the last thing I'm going to say on that is that BG have something like a 53% market share in dealerships in the USA because they do the job well for their partners, their customers, their customers being the garages. So let's continue doing a good job for everybody. Let's continue charging the right money that means that it's a professional job done, job done professionally. And let's not throw the baby out with the bath water or, or the, you know, all sit around saying, well, I won't bother wearing a mask and I won't bother washing my hands and I won't bother with social distancing because we've got a vaccine coming. That vaccine being an EV vehicles is gonna take a lot longer to arrive than, than we possibly would imagine at the moment, despite the government protestations and uh, imploration that uh, everybody should move to an electric vehicle. If they could, they couldn't afford to anyway. Mm. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting because um, you know, like you said, I think price is still playing a big issue for the consumer at the moment in terms of actually being able to afford this technology in these vehicles. Um, I mean, we, we were talking about this the other day, Steve, weren't we? About you know, I think Toyota are trialing a solid state battery at the moment, and so all this technology is going to be moving quickly. And I think you mentioned as well about you know, actually electric motors may then start to look to have some sort of fluid in them or oil in them so they last longer. So there may be other opportunities that arise, you know, instead of our traditional, you know, oil and lubricants and then might start to take place in the EV vehicle over time in different ways anyway. I think, guys, I mean, we, we all, we're all, I think pretty much we're all old enough to remember what mobile phones used to look like, you know, when they were the size of a house brick and they, you know, one long, co one long phone call would knock the battery out. And it took us kind of 25 years to get here, really, or, or thereabouts. Um, we're trying to do the same thing. I mean, the, the same kind of cycle will exist. The same kind of development cycle will exist. We're trying to do it a hell of a lot quicker, though, aren't we? I mean, so we know, you're, you're right. We know that, you know, lithium-ion has its... Um, has it has its limitations but we know there are this there are it runs into the hundreds the number of new battery chemistries that are being looked at you know including sort of solid state batteries and so on we know that um uh you know range, range will improve just like the you know the, the the call time did on our on our phones uh we're sort of at a very early point of the curve. S same as I think I said to you, I mean, you know, we've got manufacturers that are now beginning to build, use electric motors that don't use rare earths and things like that. So some of the environmental arguments that would apply today about, you know, well, are you, are you kind of taking away one problem to create another, you know, uh, um, with, with the way that some of those, some of those elements are mined and so on in, in, in certain parts of the world. You know, I, I think we're, we're, everybody's aware of that and they're moving away from it, but it's, it's a hell of a short time scale to do it in, really. Right. Um, but, but, you know, let's, let's not forget that the manufacturers are being driven. I mean, this, you know, we're looking at 2030, but at this end of things, they've got the, the so-called cafe regulations, haven't they, that they've got to, they've got to meet the, these incredibly stringent, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, um, 
emission regulations that are driving them there anyway. And I think the cafe more or less requires zero tailpipe emissions by 2030 anyway. Yeah. Uh, so even without the government doing this, the manufacturers, it, that wouldn't let the manufacturers off the hook. They, they've got to get there, you know. And at the moment, the you could argue that there are other solutions they could use for zero emissions, but um, they, they themselves, in most cases, don't believe that there's any other technology that can get them there quicker than battery electric. You know, I mean, look, hydrogen will probably come in some form, but, but you know, with the timescales involved, they're using the technology that's available, aren't they? Absolutely. And I'm not, you know, I don't think any of us sitting in this forum are, are saying that this is bad, we shouldn't do it. And I think we're all accepting the fact that there are, there are limitations. And as you said about lithium iron, I'm led to believe, um, the research we did, I think this, the world supply of lithium is something like seven years. Wow. So even if, even if we suddenly decide, yes, this is perfect, it's brilliant, we can't replace them, you can't recycle them, then suddenly they come, become another toxic problem. So yes, the manufacturers are aware of that. They will be working on other solutions, and of course they are. But the simple uh, point that I was obviously just trying to, to expand upon was the fact that the country and the individuals in the country will not be able to afford to replace 39 million engines. No, no, of course not. By, fri by Friday anyway. So, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not ignore what we're already good at. Uh, and should be getting better at and giving customers better experience for and uh, justifying why we charge the prices we charge um, and the benefits they get. And as you said about the perception of value, it's not about cost, is it? It's about value. Everything's about value. Um, and value is an internal judgment that uh, individuals make and will justify. And as I said, about 150 pound haircut, somebody will justify it. Oh, well, because I look good. I feel good. There's my justification. Mm -hmm. A lot of your point, Andy, still comes back to the root, root problem that we, we've had all along, whether it's technology or whatever. It's about that professionalism. It's about the professionalization of the industry, isn't it? You know, yeah. who's obviously you know, been the IMI's mission over the last decade. <laughs> Have a lot, but that's you know, and, and, and we'll we were set up for a hundred years ago, and uh, unfortunately, I, I think to some extent, you know, some uh, some some level of regulation helps a bit. You know, if if you were in a situation where if you were actually in a situation where people who don't know what they're doing, because let's be honest, the fact that anyone can set themselves up to service and repair cars with or without any knowledge, skills, or proper equipment doesn't help our case, does it? You know. I, I, you know, the amazing thing is, and I've had so many conversations with so many ministers who don't seem to realise there isn't any regulation. And you think, well, if there was, you'd have created it. So how can you not know that it's an unregulated industry? But I don't think that's the future. We, we have the Electricity at Work Act here. We're bound to have some regulation around autonomous cars and connected cars. And I think that's uh, that will only help us, actually, in terms of getting the value proposition across because nobody questions the value of an, an aircraft technician, mm. even though they might not be any more skilled than the guys we use. They're just checked and uh, they're just checked more than, you know, uh, than our guys are. Um, don't necessarily query uh, the cost of a, a gas engineer or a boiler technician when nobody's got hot water in the house, do they? But, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And the, and the skill set's not actually that vastly different, you know, between a gas engineer and a vehicle technician. In fact, it would be argued the vehicle technician needs to know more. So, but yeah, they seem to be undervalued. So yeah, actually, that, that beautifully segues straight into to Kev, actually, because but one of your main points, Kevin, was um, at, the, at the top of your response back to me was training, actually. But, I mean, you've, uh, you've come over with sort of two or three points here, but actually training was your, your top point, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Look, and, uh, some fascinating comments from, from the rest of the guys and I, and I agree with a lot of it. I think going back to Steve's, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we're a very resilient industry. You know, I'm very proud to work in the automotive aftermarket and, and every new trend represents a challenge, but also opportunities. And, you know, we're in a fortunate position here at Bosch because we're leading the way on the OE and also here in the aftermarket, trying to help our customers, our distributors, our partners and our garages cope with these challenges. And there is hope, you know, these products will fail. These new products that are fitted to vehicles will go wrong. They're still exposed to the, the wet and the road salt and you know, damage. So they'll represent new product opportunities, which, which I think Prashant and Andy have said will come along. And where one of the things we're working on this year is to try and crystallize that for our customers, for our distributors and our garages saying, as the technology evolves, yes, you'll sell fewer of these, but you'll sell more of these. 
and here are some new products that you'll sell. Um, so there's, there's, there is definitely an opportunity. I think, I think where I'm concerned, you know, the industry is always coped with evolution. It always has, it always will. But when you've got a hard stop and not, not a policy, a lot of list of policies that then support the, the sector and society to cope with that revolution as opposed to evolution, that's where I've got some concerns and, and training, as you point out, Gav, you know, apprenticeships are already underfunded. You know, there's a, been a 20% reduction in apprenticeship funding, uh, a 10% increase in costs <clears throat> because of the endpoint assessment. The gap should be filled by the employers, but employers are struggling. Both large and small employers are genuinely struggle to pay that, that, that gap. So the, the, the risk is poor training at an apprenticeship level. And, and remember now, we're asking our apprentices to do metric and imperial because in, internal combustion cars aren't going to disappear. Yet we've got to, so we've got to train them on internal combustion engine technology and EV and hybrid. So we're actually, the training's getting more complex and more filled because those vehicle technologies will exist on the road for 25, 30, 50 years to come. So that, that's a real concern for me is that the people coming into the industry are getting, uh, not getting the right training and the right, right start in their careers. You could then go right the way through to existing technicians, parts people, valeters everybody in our sector needs to understand these electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles because you know the, the, it's not just about giving poor service to a consumer these things will damage you physically permanently you know so there's a real health and safety risk here so so for me training is education is the, the starting point because then that derives well, what insurance policy do i need because i understand the technology what training do i need to give my guys what equipment do i need to give my guys and girls what how does the workshop need to be laid out what partners do I need from a parts perspective or a services perspective? So, so education is, is fundamentally key for me. And I think then as a, as a citizen of the UK, I think there's some big questions here because this, this forced change to EV and hybrid and all the benefits it has, and we understand that from emissions and safety and you know, drivability and you know, the digital age, we all get that and we're part of it. But remember, a, 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 a hybrid vehicle has 10 times le less parts than an internal combustion engine. It has 10 times fewer manpower requirements in the production and logistics of that vehicle. So there's going to be a huge impact on employment here, huge impact. And are we ready as that for society? And also moving away from fuel duty and fuel tax, there's going to be a big gap in the government coffers. And I'm sure Steve's, Steve's come across this in his, his dealings with the government. So how are the government going to fill that gap? It's going to be road tax. It's going to be pay per use roads. You know, we talk about pay per use phones. You'll have much, much more, income so i think there's an industry focus we've got to have which i touched on in you know, new opportunities training challenges there's the education element for the entire sector but then as a society look there's some big impact here and are we ready for it as, as the uk and ireland i don't know are we ready yeah, yeah. Good, to be honest with you, good point mate. I, I hadn't even considered the things like the you know the loss in fuel duty and stuff like that yeah i mean that's uh, you know it, it's gonna it's not just the you know I suppose the bubble we live in is the is the industry at the moment is the wider is the wider impact in society altogether, isn't it? You know, so. and, and the infrastructure, you know, uh, the infrastructure. Have we got the charging points, the national grid impact? Look, I mean, I think there's nobody on this call saying let's not do it. We all want to do it. We will do it, and we'll meet the challenges. But we need the policies and the support from the government in place to help us deliver that. And, I, and I'm not sure the words and music are matching. Mm. And it's an interesting thing. This week, I'm, I'm sure you all saw it, uh, um, Norway became the first country where uh, electrified vehicles uh, outnumbered um, uh, internal combustion engine cars in new car sales. Uh, I think it was projected that we would get there about 2025. <laughs> that projection was there before the, um, be before the current situation, before the 2030 date was brought in. I'm not sure technically whether it's possible for the manufacturers to it's going to be around that time i don't think it will have come forward much because you've got to have the products available haven't you but you know you've got big players like volkswagen group who are absolutely committed to this who are bringing huge numbers of new vehicles to market um uh so but you're so you're you're right the government have as yet have got haven't got a stated policy how they're going to replace uh um lost taxes and so on but we know that they will they'll have to won't they uh, and they'll have to come up and it'll be an awkward model as well because as you've rightly said on the 
you know, 31st of December 2030, we'll probably still have around 30 million plus internal combustion engine cars on the road, plus a whole load of electric and uh, uh, hybrid cars. So it's going to be a bit messy for a while, isn't it, in terms of how they collect revenues and so on. But it, it is, it is, Steve, you're right. And I, <clears throat> it's, we're going to have dual technology for a long time to come. You know, you're going to have internal combustion, which is great because we're all, you know, we've all paid our mortgages or pay our mortgage on that today, and as do thousands and thousands of other people. We can embrace the new challenge of EV and hybrid like our industry always has. Um, but it's that forced hard stop, which I think is going to, going to give a lot of challenges to people. And, and, you know, livelihoods will be lost because of this. And, 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 and there's a risk of giving poor service to the consumer as well because of that. I think as well, I mean, and I guess it's part of my job, not only my job, I mean, other organisations like SMMT, RMI and so on, and, and, and so you know, there's 48 trade bodies in this industry, so there's a lot of voices, but the government have to fill in the gaps. I mean, we all know that it was, it was government policy that made people adopt diesels, mm. you know. They didn't know what a diesel particulate was at that point in time, you know, uh, uh, and, and they only discovered those things later on nitrous oxide or whatever, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, th those issues became were something they had to deal with after the fact and they need to do it better this time. I mean, they, they understand what they're trying to achieve, but they need to understand what the collaterals yeah. are from that, don't they? You know, exactly, and, and the, the internal combustion engine can, play, can play a part towards zero emissions. You know, the synthetic fuels, there's improvements still in the internal combustion engine to get to zero emissions. We know we want water and oxygen to be coming out of that pipe, nothing else. And there's still mm. technology, you know, growth potential there. And, you know, synthetic fuels must play a part, you know, in, in that moving forward. So we can, we, as a society, we can achieve that, that zero carbon emissions and zero, you know, poison gas coming out of the vehicle. But it yeah. doesn't. You know, I think it's a blended approach rather than a hard stop with one technology disappearing. I don't think that's that's the right sensible solution. Some of the new Euro 6 diesel engines are, are cleaner than ever, cleaner than some of the petrol, aren't they? And that's, that's the, the misconception that's out there in terms of the consumer and the general public is that diesel, like Steve was saying, was, you know, 20 years ago was the thing that was being peddled. And now it's the thing that's been stuck in the ground type thing, but actually... Again, the misconception is that some of the new diesel engines are, 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 are exceptionally clean. Yeah, we've done, we've done experiments in, in the real world where the air coming out of the car is cleaner than the air going in. I think you the know, air yeah. all of this though, yeah. are incredibly challenging because uh, I, I mean, I know from my former life that yeah, when you get down to the levels of emission that diesel cars are at now, each incremental step is, is exponentially more expensive to achieve. So to get from sort of 90 grams down to zero is hugely expensive. But at the same time, you know, I don't think anybody actually makes money out of electric cars at the moment. I mean, that's that, the, the economics of that are still being worked through. You know, I mean, the, 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 the huge wealth that Tesla has generated is not really actually on the product. It's around their, their expected share value and everything else, isn't it? But but, um, you know, again, we're, I'm, I'm sure we'll get there, but at the moment, the battery is 50% of the value of the car, <laughs> you know, and, and that has to come down and it will do, it will do. But uh, yeah, it's, in, uh, in, in, interesting, it's an interesting challenge that, that, that we face, but you're right, we've got to, I think the other thing is when I talk about filling in the gaps, I mean, other issues like MOT, you know, making sure the MOT is fit for purpose around electric cars, ADAS, autonomous cars and all that kind of thing. I mean, those things need to move at the same pace as they're expecting everybody else to move. Mm. Yeah. We still, can't, we still can't test adaptive headlights, Steve, so God knows what we're going to do. <laughs> so it's, it's right, you know, the, the, it's the words of music. The words, it's all right having the ambition. Everybody on this call and our industry supports the ambition. It's having the policy and the steps and the sensible support to get there. I think that's what we need. <laughs> Ben, uh, Ben Davies, that is Ben. Ben it is uh, from an insurance point of view. I mean, are are, are EVs currently uh, more expensive to insure than than uh, a comparable internal combustion engine car? Well, one of the main points when we spoke to well, when I spoke to some of the underwriters was is how they're rated. Um, you know, they're, they're they're having to now be rated on not necessarily any emissions that are coming out of them, but they're being rated on things such as performance because 
it can't be they can't be rated the same as an internal combustion engine um so one of the insurers i had a, a long chat about this was um someone had moved half their fleet over to an ev fleet but it ended up being more expensive on the pure basis that the the electric vehicle was rated on a different number so i think it was you know your ev vehicles rated around an, you know route 27 insurance whereas the similar internal combustion was a lot lot less so um we are finding they're being rated differently i think just touching on what, on what kevin said in terms of things like fuel duty is there will come a point when evs will be that prevalent on the road that we will have a reduced fuel duty on diesels and petrols and evs will have to have some kind of duty at some point being applied to them so there will be a, a come a time where there's a switch. And I think at that point, maybe the insurance will have to be adjusted accordingly. Um, but as and when, I, I, I wouldn't even want to speculate a time frame because it's, it's such a fluid market as well. Um, and just, just what Kevin and, and Andy said is the, the technology and the information coming out of, of every part of the motor industry all feeds into the insurance element and, and that risk that risk assessment and risk awareness of where the premiums come from. So I, I couldn't even give you a date on that one, Steve. So the, so the, 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 bit you, the, the, the point you made about electric cars being rated in higher groups because of performance, that's because, uh, sorry, I'm putting the words in your mouth, but, but is that because the relatively few electric cars that, that hit the market first all yeah. had kind of... Um, pretty, pretty, pretty hefty acceleration, didn't they? I mean, you're, you're at yeah. you've got sort of S pack Tesla Model S, sports pack Tesla Model S that accelerates naught to six in about four seconds or something. Yeah. And, I, I, and actually, the truth is that's something which will change as well, isn't it? Of course, uh, so. won't it? Because I mean, actually, nobody really needs that level of acceleration, <laughs> and less acceleration will give you more range, won't it? I mean, of uh, course, it will. Mm. So I think. But it's, it's so, I guess what we're saying, it's a moving feast, isn't it? Or an evolving yeah. feast. Yeah, yeah, completely is, completely is, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Again, it comes back to the education, doesn't it, Ben? Ben too, that is. <laughs> you're right there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I was uh, just talking about um, uh, educate, uh, thinking about that around education, actually. And I think we touched on it earlier, um, Kevin, obviously with the you know, Bosch Car Service Network and everything else that you guys uh, run, and marry, uh, run and manage. It's, uh, you know, back to the consumer. What, you know, do you think their expectations are being, well, around education being managed well enough? Um, you know, it's more of an industry thing we need to do or is that a, a government thing? Uh, I, don't, I don't have the answer, Gary. Look, we, we, I mean, lots of great, there's lots of great companies in the aftermarket who try and educate workshops and distributors and, you know, there's, there's lots of, lots of, commendable effort you know we do our bit we try and you know that but i think one of the challenges we've got and it comes back to the consumer and i think everyone's mentioned it cost versus value you know cost is what you pay value is what you get all well we can trot those things out i think the challenge we've got is the most popular automotive fuel in the uk probably in the world talks nothing about the real technologies and the challenges of vehicles you know top gear just talks about the entity it's an entertainment show mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's definitely a space for the consumer to understand that they're driving around now in mobile computer networks, entertainment centers that do 150 miles an hour round corners with the kids in the back safely. You know, the phenomenal pieces of engineering. And, and in, as such, you need a phenomenal service network to deal with it. You need trained technicians, you need competent businesses with the supply chain, whether that's parts or services, etc. There's no comprehension of that in the consumer. There's, you know, I talk to people you know, in the pub, in family circles, you know, they've got no comprehension what goes into a vehicle and how difficult it is to maintain and, and, and service. So there has to be something. We, you know, we need a prime time TV show that, that talks about these things because there's a prime time TV show that doesn't talk about it. And well, I, think I mean, I think, I think I mean, yourself or, or so, yeah, a, a number of the other guys are interested in know your views, but do you think that, that knowledge gap, that perception gap, if you like, on the part of the uh, customers, do you... Do you not think it's it's widened? Because I think Gavin said earlier on, he just mentioned about his dad being out on the drive constantly fiddling with the car. We all remember that. I mean, cars were something you had to know something about because mm -hmm. they would let you down at some point in time. You had to know the basics of charging your battery and, you know, sorting out the car when the carburetor had flooded and all those kind of things. 
nobody needs that now. I mean, people go into a blind panic when their washer bottle empties. Exactly. So that's, that means going under the bonnet. So, so in a way, the perception, you know, when you, t when you, when you worked on your car, you understood what you, you know, you, you didn't know just what you knew. You knew what you didn't know as well. You appreciated the stuff that was difficult. Whereas I don't know whether people do anymore. You know, they know no more about the car than they do about the insides of their laptop. I think it was Ben Two's point, you know, mobile phones, you know, there's an expectation. Nobody knows, nobody knows how the iPhone works. Nobody's got a comprehension. And what they definitely don't know is that there's automotive sensors inside the iPhone that were developed for vehicles that are now using the iPhone, that when you flip the screen, that's an automotive sensor that makes that work. So they've got absolutely no comprehension how the car works, especially EV, autonomous connected. Steve, it's, it's space magic. That's a, They've got no idea. So... I mean, but we can't do that on our own as an industry. We need, you know, there has to be, I don't know what the solution is, Steve, but yeah, I agree. The gap has definitely widened as yeah. technology is exploding in our life on everything, phones, laptops, TVs. Nobody knows how it works. It's like space magic, as I say. You kind of let the cat out of the bag, Kevin, because this was actually a lead up to our new YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that for the record. I didn't gear. Gear. <laughs> the true gear or whatever we need to call it. But, but you're right, you know, it's everybody sees the £250,000 supercar or the Bugatti Veyron, and it, it is all great and the cinema, cinema photography on it and all that stuff on them shows is fantastic, but it doesn't actually really get down to the, the it only, uh, you know, it, it scrapes to the top of the surface. Yeah in terms of what the real industry is about and, and, and the things that go on within it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, Gav, the only other vis visualisation to get at workshops is the under the arches in some of the soap operas. So there's no, re you know, there's the, the entire middle ground is completely missed. Mm. I think as well, I, I, you know, when, when you think of our relationship with the car, you know, we've talked about people owning cars, but actually most people don't now, do they? I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to new cars, the number of people who turn up with a pillowcase full of pound, pound coins is pretty small, isn't it? You know, it's um, we're, we're just buying the use of a car now and, 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 and maybe less so in the future. You know, we're moving gently towards things like subscription schemes and things like that, which, mean, which means we need to worry even less about what goes on under the bonnet because that all comes in the deal. You know, somebody else takes care of all of that. Not just We've re Sorry, Steve, we've, re we've renamed our automotive division to mobility. So it's not called automotive anymore. It's a mobility division because that's what people need and want. True, yeah. But one of the good things about the mobility issue is that, you know, car, the, the cars that we have will probably get used more. You know, I mean, most cars are used, what, less than 10% of the time, aren't they? They're either sat outside your house, outside your office or outside a shop. Um, they're, you know, very little time actually on the road. And, and, and I, think that, I think that's a prediction that's been yeah. made by a few analysts that, the, that with, a, with a broader use, maybe possible sharing of, uh, uh, in some way, that, that we'll see more use of those vehicles and therefore they'll have higher service requirements. Yeah, agree. You we know. agree. COVID set that back a touch. Obviously, car sharing is a touchy subject and understandably so at the minute, but the projections are car sharing, car usage will increase even if the number of vehicles reduces, yeah. I think as well, if, you, if the cars are ultimately owned by a big organisation rather than by an individual, so, so you know, you as the driver don't worry about the servicing, but I think you're, you, you've got a better chance of the, the ultimate owner of the vehicle understanding the, the service and maintenance requirements and the value in that than perhaps your average motorist does. And perhaps, Steve, uh, perhaps also the duty of care to those users. Mm. Uh, that's true, yeah. That's a good point, actually. Very good yeah, point. Agree. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Just, just by illustration, Steve, what you're saying there, one of our larger customers is a couple of councils, and, you know, they, they over the last few years have come to realisation and now over-service. They're very happy for the fact that we've proven to them that lifetime extension is very important to them and the cost of obviously vehicle re re downtime, repair, recovery, et cetera, and, and loss of, these are school buses and things, loss of, loss of earning times is far greater than the cost of an extra oil change. Yeah. So yeah. Big, big manufacturers or big owners of vehicles or big corporations or big companies, whoever it is, when they finally look at the numbers and go, well, it's going to cost me X, but it's going to, in revenue and income and downtime and, and everything else, it's going to cost me three times X. It's a no brainer. 
And, and it and and you know, in in those cases, they're talking about extremely big numbers, aren't they? I I, I was talking to a guy from Enterprise actually, and Enterprise are I'm sure you guys know they're the world's biggest hire company. They don't talk about car hire anymore. You know, they they again they 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 talk about mobility because who better maybe to supply you with what car you want when you want it on a subscription basis than a company that owns zillions of them. You know, yeah. uh, uh, and but again, they do understand that that they have a. It's easier to convince them, perhaps. I mean, they're obviously coin operated. Everybody is. Yeah, but but but. But understanding the value of spending a little bit to gain a bit is is easier to do mm. when you're dealing with it kind of collectively than with your average individual motorist, you know, many of whom think that the annual MOT is good enough to, to keep their car running. Um, just conscious we've been going about an hour, guys, so I probably want to just start. Sorry, Gab, your lips are moving, but I can't hear you. Oh, can't you hear me? It's probably ordered his lunch on the side Steve that's what he'll be doing <laughs> anyone else tell me no, I think you're right the big companies are risk averse aren't they guys so that you get more traction in the conversations with the larger organisations at duty of care as Prashant said risk aversion you know and understanding that the impact of, of not doing something well is far greater than as you say paying an extra couple of quid on a, on a service for a bit more oil so but that, that's 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 a segment of the market we can attract and, and deal with but the you know the, the vast majority of the retail customers that we the garage you see that's that's the big challenge right I just wondered, I mean, I, I know you guys are, okay. I know you guys are Bosch, are, but Prashant and Andy, I mean, are you, are you, are you, uh, are you engaging at all with things like uh, a battery technology? I mean, in, from a manufacturing point of view, I mean, or manufacturing or distribution point of view, electric motors or, or um, uh, uh, batteries, battery technology? So, Steve, uh, I've had some conversations with some guys who claim to have some fancy battery tech. Um, I've also, interestingly enough, I had a very uh, nice networking session um, with an association I'm part of, and there was a manufacturer of drivetrains for EV. It's, I don't exactly understand what that means because it's space magic, as, as Kevin calls it. Uh, but uh, I did ask the question of what's the serviceability of those items? And they actually said, he, he said something very interesting to me. He said that in Holland, um, a lot of the, the taxis there have really embraced these Teslas for many years. I, I, I don't understand what the government subsidies are, but they must be huge uh, mm -hmm. to have kicked that all off. And he was saying they've got literally three, 400,000 miles on the clock. And in terms of take the tires out of the equation and you know, your, your basic exterior things and windscreen wipers and so on, they, uh, the, the car's actually still running and that the battery performance is dropping to about 80% of what it was uh, original life, but still it can still be charged up to 80% and it's not dying below that. So there's still quite a lot of functionality um, coming out of those cars. So my question to him was more about, well, the serviceability, are the vehicle manufacturers recognizing that uh, if there's not much to service, what's going to happen to our wonderful aftermarket side of thing and their parts divisions and their trade clubs and so on, as you all know, Steve. Um, and uh, yeah. they said that some people are thinking about what sort of elements to bring into serviceability. Um, but a lot of the systems are so modular now that if one little component goes, you have to take the whole thing out and check a huge, great thing in. So the cost is, is quite prohibitive. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking, we're definitely looking. Um, we've, we've got some ideas. We've definitely got some plans coming uh, later in the year, which, which may definitely amuse the people on, on, this, um, on, on this conversation for sure of, of what we'll be launching. But uh, yeah, I think it's about engaging in different spaces and just being creative, really. Okay. It sounds perhaps like a, a natural place to stop. Um, Gavin's got a, uh, a, a faulty microphone, so he can't, he can't thank you all. So uh, I'll come on and thank you all for your time. It's been a really... Interesting one. I'm off to uh, direct line to check on my uh, insurance, uh, along with Steve and, and everybody else. Uh, but thanks again, guys. I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to talk some more, perhaps more from that sort of subject of a consumer perspective that has really come forward. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation.
Thanks very much. Cheers, Thank Thanks very Cheers, much. Guys. All the best. Cheers, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.